Hello everybody and welcome to Corridors of Flower. This is panel will all be about increasing access to nature in the UK. My name's Kitty, I'm chairing today's panel. I'm also a nature programme manager here at the Conservative Environment Network. For those that don't know, we are the independent forum for conservatives in the UK and around the world who support net zero, nature restoration and resource security. Before giving a bit of background about the event, I just want to take a second to thank our sponsors. So thank you so much Chester Zoo for making this event possible today. Thank you for your generosity. So thank you Chester Zoo. So the topic of access to nature really rose to prominence during the COVID lockdown as it became clear that those without gardens was often without a green space to access very easily. And with that in mind, the government earlier this year announced a new target for that everybody to have 15 minutes access to their nearest green space. But what that means for individuals is, remains to be seen, although there's lots of government initiatives to help make it happen. Also, the role that councils can play through their local nature recovery strategies, as well as their green parks more generally, and also the role that MPs through the government can play in ensuring that everybody has access to high quality nature, because obviously not a green space isn't always a high quality green space. So how can we make sure that people have access to nature, but also access to high quality nature? That's enough from me. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our panelists for their short introductory remarks. And first, I'll turn to Rebecca Powell, MP. Rebecca is MP for Taunton Dean and also the Minister for Environmental Quality and Resilience, as well as a founding member of the SENS Parliamentary Caucus. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Something I'm always very proud of. I had to get that in as a founding member of SEN and all the great work that they have done. Actually, if I'm honest, to influence policy. Um, and uh, as I said in an earlier event, I was involved in uh, writing a holistic plan for environmental policy when I first came to Parliament, when I was a backbencher, uh, working with SEN. It was their first ever pamphlet. I can see some people in the room now uh, who wrote essays in that pamphlet. And almost all of that is now in policy. And a great amount of that has actually driven us towards the position we're now in today. And whatever you hear in the media, in the press, and about the nature reports and so forth, I do believe we've made some really big steps uh, in the direction of uh, looking after nature more. Uh, and we do need to do that. Uh, but also totally integrating it with the other things that happen in this country. Uh, which has a very large population, as you know, and not least integrating with our agricultural system, where it's still really important that we produce food, but we have uh, a, a, a wonderful, thriving nature working in contrast with that. And um, I grew up on a farm myself, uh, and uh, I'm actually very proud. I think it was a bit of a model farm even then, because my dad only cut the hedges every other year um, for the nature and the wildlife. And now we're actually paying farmers to do that um, because it does have such a good impact and it's such a simple thing to do. I also garden in my own garden, which I did used to open to, uh, for charity before I came to Parliament. And I garden for nature and wildlife. Um, so uh, leaving long grasses for the insects and the pollinators uh, and, and I manage it organically. And I think all those things have influenced what I do in DEFRA. Um, and so I just want to touch, we have introduced, this is mainly about the quality of nature and access. Yeah, we've, uh, we've inter we have all realised how important it is to be in touch with nature. For me, it is my own respite uh, and relaxation um, away from um, Parliament. Um, and I don't know what I'd do without it, if I'm honest. Uh, but, you know, we're bringing that into our policy. So, for example, we um, have extended the, the newly titled King Charles the Third uh, England Coastal Path uh, with its 400 miles opened. Uh, that's just been done in this Parliament. Uh, we've actually already restored an area the size of Dorset with a lot of our nature schemes. Uh, millions of pounds, as you will know, is going into landscape recovery schemes. Uh, uh, just to mention one of our schemes, but you know, in Somerset, we've got the Super Nature Reserve. That's uh, in fact, Ben probably knows all about this as well. She's in Somerset, we've linked up five nature reserves and then brought in surrounding farmers with our payments to a lot of the schemes so that they can all link up on a big wide scale to produce the corridors for nature that we need, uh, whilst enabling the farmers also to earn a living, uh, which is very important. Um, We've had our Green Recovery Challenge Fund, which was so important in COVID, uh, in actually uh, s supporting a lot of uh, uh, schemes where we could co contact more people with nature, uh, particularly the Children in Nature programme. And actually, I, I, I agree with what Kitty's just said. We've got our new no 
local nature recovery strategies where councils will be so important in working out where the nature should be, where it should go, how it will link in with all those other demands that we have on our very precious spaces, um, not least improving the contact for, for people who are in urban areas and enabling them to access nature more quickly. So there's so much to talk about, in also water, I'm the water minister, and I want to see all these schemes linking up with um, one of the main focuses in our plan for water, which is working on a catchment scale um, to work up and down from the headwaters to the coast, uh, linking all our schemes together, also for those corridors for nature, especially along rivers, our buffer stones along rivers, um, and and, and, and bringing it all together under one hat. And we've got some very good examples of where we started to do that and chalk rivers in particular. Uh, and we've got a real focus on chalk rivers now. But they're all great conduits for nature. But they're also so brilliant for we humans uh, to access them. So it's about getting the balance right um, and I think bringing it all together. And I, I, I genuinely think we, 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 we understand this. And many of our policies are driving in this, this direction, but obviously interested to hear what the audience says and the other panellists. So I'll leave it there, Kitty. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rebecca. Next up, we had Chris Grayling, MP for Epsom and Yule. And Chris is also a very proactive member of SEN's Parliamentary Caucus and a big advocate for strengthening the protections of our marine protected areas. Over to you, Chris. Great, thanks. Well, thanks, Kitty. And um, let me start by addressing something I think we should all be addressing, which is that as Conservatives in government over 13 years, we've actually done probably more for the environment than any government in modern times. Uh, and far too often, what we get from uh, 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 the NGOs in this country, for the wonderful people, but they do, I think, often, far too often, misrepresent what we've done and what we haven't done. Uh, and I think there's a good story there that we should all focus on in the run-up to the election. I can think of no other government that has done so much to try and, for example, rebalance the relationship between farming and nature. Uh, and that's not easy because we need to grow food as well. Uh, that has done more to make sure that local authorities focus on nature in their planning. Uh, that has done more to target resource at individual projects. You know, most recently, the, uh, the DEFRA funds to try and support individual endangered species in this country to support species recovery. So there is some really good work being done and will continue to be done, and I hope will continue to be done after the election. I think the second point I'd make is that access to nature, I'm all in favour of access to green spaces, but access to nature has to be handled quite carefully. Um, we, I don't think, can just have a free-for-all where everyone gets access to everything. It would be lovely if you could, but actually we also need to provide an environment where we can genuinely see species recovery. Uh, and so we have to be quite careful how we manage the countryside uh, and the way we manage projects that are designed to see the restoration of species in this country to make sure that in providing rightly access to the public, we're not actually damaging the prospects for those species and their recovery. So it's just a balance has to be there in policy making. Uh, but I also want to pay a particular uh, tribute to those involved in an area which is often controversial, and that is rewilding. Uh, I am not in favour of rewilding the whole countryside. We have to grow food. But there are some fantastic projects out there that make and will make a real difference and do provide access to nature. We always read about NEP, and many of you have been to NEP, and it's a fantastic project. There's a, an amazing project done by the WWT down just outside Bridgewater. Um, uh, uh, there's a project that's just in its infancy uh, in Somerset, Heal Rewilding. I was down there having a wander around a few, few weeks ago, uh, and it's going to be a fantastic project. Uh, just kind of the first stages of rewilding. Creating a, a proper oases for wildlife uh, and giving the public a chance to see uh, 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 wildlife in a way they wouldn't do otherwise, just go and see the storks at NEP. Uh, so that is very important, but it's one other thing that also has to be very carefully done. And here, local authorities and national government have a real role to play, and that is making sure that we don't just create islands for nature, because it doesn't work like that. You have to have corridors for birds, corridors for mammals on the ground, and so this is the importance of the local nature recovery strategies. They, in my view, can fill in the gaps between the very good work that's being done in a growing number of centres around the country to encourage nature restoration, 
So make sure it is joined up. It's not just, oh, we can do a bit there and a bit there, because it doesn't work like that. Uh, and I think local authorities in particular, as they shape their strategies, need to make sure that it is sufficiently connected for the species to recover, to move, migrate, uh, and do well in the way we want in the future. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, our next panelist is Ben Goldsmith. Ben wears many hats in the nature sphere, but one of them is the chair of the SEN. Over <coughs> to you, Ben. Thank you so much. I mean, it's pretty damn exciting um, for those of us that have been fascinated by nature all our lives to be sitting at the Conservative Party conference hearing Chris's speech, you know, the minister next to me, Rebecca, talking with such joy and ambition about the things that the government has done. I mean, I, I was just before coming to this, I was almost late because I was sitting in the joint tent of National Trust, RSPB, and um, I think the Wildlife Trust. And the thing we were saying to each other is, you know, we whinge a lot about what, what we want for nature in this country, but if we just imagine we could go back in time seven or eight years and tell ourselves what's been done in the last five or six, we, we wouldn't believe it. I mean, the complete rethink of agricultural subsidies, the, the, the environment bill with its ratcheting targets for nature recovery. Chris is right, Ama amazing things have happened. It, it'll never be enough. And at times it seemed like the government has turned good news into bad news. I don't think the, the comms around a lot of this stuff has been handled uh, uh, particularly well at lots of times. And I think what's really exciting is that the government's starting to do cost-benefit analysis around what nature can do for us. You know, the, the idea, for example, that, you know, that, that, that we can help reduce flooding and drought, which of course are two sides of the same coin, by restoring nature in sensitive parts of the catchment. I mean, that's quite basic science. You know, healthy landscapes act like sponges. And we know that you know, if you have uh, wiggly streams and wetlands and ponds and, and, and patches of scrub and, and, and wet peatlands and so on, and all these things that we've drained and cleared during the last 50 to 100 years, that when the rain falls, the landscape acts like a sponge. It absorbs the water and releases it slowly throughout the year. It's a really cost-effective way to store water while keeping farmers in business, because, of course, they're receiving the payments for this service. And this kind of rational cost-benefit analysis, I think, is the biggest change that's taken place in the last few years in this country. We've started to understand that seagrass meadows and coastal salt marshes and peatlands and scrubby wood pastures have real tangible value for society and that we're prepared to pay for those. Um, but, it, but a kind of cold-headed cost-benefit analysis isn't going to be enough if we're going to restore nature to what it could be in this country, if we're going to halt the decline and, and restore in a big way. And, and, and both of the previous speakers touched upon this idea of, of need, you know, the idea that we need contact with nature on an individual and a collective level. You know, in, in ways that we can't well understand or articulate. You know, science uncovers fragments of that mystery with every passing year. I mean, who'd, who'd have believed you if you said 10 years ago that all the trees in a woodland are communicating with each other continually via a great wood-wide web? You know, they're not just sharing information with each other, but caring for each other, sh passing each other nutrition and, and, and energy and so on. Well, it's true. You know, Who'd have believed you if, 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 you'd, if you'd said that um, the trees release compounds, that when we breathe them in, they lower our heart rate, you know, they lower our blood pressure, they, they make us feel happier. You know, wh why they do this, we don't know, but they do it. And the Japanese health service now prescribes forest bathing for that very reason. You know, Californian researchers have discovered that hospital patients who can just see nature out of the window heal faster. You know, pris prisoners are less likely to reoffend if they spend time growing their own potatoes. So on some visceral level, we really need connection with this, this kind of, um, uh, uh, this, this living fabric that exists all around us. Um, and I think that it's this emotional or even spiritual connection with nature that, that has started to become more prominent in the last few years, perhaps since the, the COVID lockdowns and so on, people have started to discover nature around where they live. And, and, and what's been revealed by this growing movement is the iniquity of access. You know, summarized, if, if you're not rich or rural, you know, you don't really have that much access to nature. And I think that's a massive societal priority, is to, is to enable people to access nature, and, and not just to take them to it, but to bring nature to them. You know, I, it was maybe a little bit awkward when I met Sadiq Khan for the first time in Glasgow at the conference, um, and, um, and I suggested a rewilding London task force, because I'm obsessional about these things, and, and it happened. And the task force is bringing nature into the city. This is something that can be done in every town and city. We can bring nature to where people live, whilst also granting them access to nature away from where they live. And I, 
I think it's a it's a hugely important topic and one that I I think is also a good news factory for the Conservative Party. You know, this is a place in which we can make people feel very happy if we so choose. Um, so I'm grateful to be on the panel to discuss it. Thank you, Ben, and a lot of threads there to pull later on in the discussion. Next up, we have Abby Brown. Among, as well as being a councillor, Abby is also the deputy leader of the Conservative Group of the Local Government Association. Over to you, Abby. Well, thank you very much. And it's great to be here and to see so many people. Um, I was saying to a few panellists beforehand, these are always such really well-attended events with a whole range of different people. I know there's a number of councillors in the room. We've already heard about some of the fantastic things that the government have done. And of course, local authorities are working in partnership with the government on this really important agenda. You know, Some fantastic projects come forward, £25 million invested into the Species Survival Fund, supporting projects up to £3 million in various locations across the country, creating green jobs and employment opportunities, whilst also tackling habitat loss, safeguarding ecosystems and creating nature-rich landscapes. And of course, we've also seen the government's Urban Tree Challenge Fund supporting 46 projects last year, planting over 25,000 trees, and also the Leveling Up Parks Fund with £9 million to improve green spaces in over 100 of the dis most disadvantaged communities across the country. But there's actually lots of local authorities who are doing things on their own initiative too to further advance this important agenda. Mass tree planting is very popular amongst local authorities. For example, Kent County Council. They've committed to planting a tree for every one of their residents. That's 1.5 million trees going in um, across Kent. Similarly, I'm going to embarrass somebody who I knew would be in the room today, but he didn't know that I knew that he'd be in the room today, but he is doing a fantastic job in his own um, authority, which is Ian Quartz, who sat at the back, who I know is a huge champion of this. Solly Hall Metropolitan Borough Council is actually a national case study for its Wildlife Ways programme, which has seen 51,000 trees planted to reduce CO2 emissions. Surrey County Council, similarly, implementing nature recovery plan to restore nature access across the county, working with communities and landowners, and that's backed by over a quarter of a million pounds worth of funding. Their strategy focuses on measures to reverse biodiversity loss, reconnect habitats and protect wildlife, alongside considering other environmental benefits, including fr flood regulation, water quality, resilience to wildfires, to, um, um, and improved access to green space for health and wellbeing. But of course, it's worth remembering, isn't it, that Conservatives, um, this is part of our ethos, this is part of our DNA um, as a, a political party, caring for our, our environment. It's nothing new to us, actually. A great example of this, Lincolnshire County Council. They've been working with Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust since 1960 to protect 80 kilometres of the county's best verges as roadside nature reserves. So that's over 60 years worth of positive action led by a Conservative Council. And they haven't stopped there. Between 2009 and 2015, citizen science surveys resulted in a further 300 kilometres of verges designated as local wildlife sites in Lincolnshire, nearly 100 hectares of wildflower-rich habitat. Many councils, of course, have also declared climate emergencies to work towards net zero. And earlier this year, Climate Emergency UK published a local authority scoreboard to rate performance in responding to climate change. And in the top five, were two Conservative councils. Solly Hall, again, which is definitely leading the way. Ian, you're going to struggle to get out because everybody's going to come and talk to you afterwards about the fantastic work that you are doing. But also Wiltshire as well, led by fantastic Conservative leader in Richard Cluer. We have such a strong record in local government too around this particular agenda as Conservatives, which ultimately ensures, which I think is the most important thing, that not only are we doing the right thing for our places, but actually we are doing the right thing for the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby, for that. And last but by no means least, we have Dr. Simon Dowell. Simon is the Conservation Science and Policy Director at Chester Zoo. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted that we're able to um, sponsor this event uh, from Chester Zoo, and I'm also delighted to be on the panel. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, we've heard some really great opening remarks from all the panelists, um, and I would like to acknowledge, as a member of the NGO community, um, the work that's been done uh, and the progress that has been made. Um, but in support of the NGO community, I would say a lot of that progress has come about as a result of the pressure NGOs have, have put on politicians, of both parties actually, over the years. And so I'm proud of the part that we've played uh, in that, uh, as, as well as many of my colleagues for, from the NGO community. So um, now many of you will know us as one of the UK's leading zoos, and I wonder, we're, we're just down the road here. How many people here have, have visited Chester Zoo? Oh, that's great, yeah. But there's so quite a few of, you who have, a few of you who haven't. So if, 
you're visiting Manchester, then do pop down to, to Chester and, and come and see us. Um, we have um, uh, over 3,000 species of animals and plants. We have 2 million visitors a year, um, and we have 60 hectares of zoological gardens. But we also have a wider zoo estate uh, of another 200 hectares. Part of that we use for biodiversity conservation. And we are, first and foremost, a biodiversity conservation and education charity um, and amongst uh, the biggest areas of our work is the work we do to recover native species in the UK and indeed to connect British people with nature in the communities around them. And we're particularly active in doing that on our own doorstep in Cheshire and a key example is our Nature Recovery Corridor project and this was made pro possible by a £1 million grant from the Green Recovery Challenge Fund which the, the Minister has already mentioned. And so by working with, uh, very closely with local people and community groups, with schools, fellow wildlife charities, and indeed our own local authority, Cheshire Western Chester, which is Labour, by the way, so Labour um, authorities are good at doing this as well, um, the project has successfully brought a 15-square-mile area in and around Chester back to life. Um, we've created and restored 60 hectares of habitats, wetlands, orchards, hedgerows, uh, and, of course, wildflower meadows, um, and wildlife is beginning to return as a result. And we engaged over 12,000 local people in this project through a series of community-based activities. Some of these people were creating and restoring the habitats themselves and taking conservation action across our city. So the GRCF funded, funding ended in March this year, but we built on the success of that and were successful in applying for a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant uh, this grant's going to be worth uh, almost a £5 million for us to expand this work and create our network for nature across West Cheshire, which will cover a 50-square-mile area between the River Mersey and the River Dee and include the, the town of Ellesmere Port. And we've added new partners to help us bring into scope local farmers and landowners and also to enable uh, us to develop the health and well-being benefits of connecting people with nature on their doorstep. And this project will be integrated into the development of the local nature recovery strategy in, Ches in Cheshire. So the government's made the commitment that everyone in the UK should be within a 15-minute uh, walk of a green or blue space. And I welcome that as a first step. But as I think has already been mentioned, uh, it needs to go further. Many of our so-called green and blue spaces are sterile environments for nature. We discovered this when we started doing our project. Parks and monocultures of regularly mown grass and lakes and rivers are dirty and polluted. So we need to bring wildlife back to these places, bring wildlife to people, as Ben said, uh, and break down the social barriers that prevent people from connecting with nature. Recent studies have shown the huge benefits this will bring in terms of improved physical and mental health outcomes. And we think our approach in Cheshire provides a really practical model of how all this can be achieved. And we'd like to see the government enabling similar projects across the UK. So we believe that a new localised and inclusive approach to nature recovery will, will empower local people to take ownership of nature restoration and ensure the success of public spaces for nature long into the future. So I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, before handing over to the audience questions, do think of some questions. I'll be over to you shortly. I just have one or two chairs privileges, we'll call it. Um, so the first thing is picking up on a theme that a few of you covered, was the idea that access to nature is inherently a personal thing. How can we get individuals out into nature? But drawing on the SEND campaign yesterday, which was called Wildflower Power, it was in recognition of, for example, the humble wildflower verge um, can become a deeply controversial thing in some local areas. And that's because one person's wildflower verge is another person's bloody mess and we, that we need to mow. So how do we bring people with us? How do we get people to reconnect with nature and see the beauty of nature and get them, get them involved and get them out there? Um, Simon, would you like to go first? Thank you. Yes, we've, we've managed to do this in our area. Of course, there are always differing views, but working with the local authority has been absolutely key to this. Um, and actually, one of, the, one of the things we did as part of our project uh, is we trained, uh, I think it's uh, 200 now, wildlife champions. And these are people who lead local community groups. They might be scout or scout groups or school groups uh, or various different types of community groups. Um, and actually, we trained them uh, to show people how to encourage wildlife, 
uh, maybe in their gardens or in the green spaces around their homes, or if they don't have gardens, in something like a window box. And that actually brings people into contact with the beauty of nature, the beauty of wildflowers, and with the insects that they bring, uh, and actually gains more support for those wilder areas uh, along roadside verges. But the, the local authority has been brilliant. They've um, actually put wild verges in every single parish across the whole borough uh, as part of the project. Thank you, Simon. Abby, did you have any tips or tricks you'd like to share on bringing the community with you? Well, I think in a similar way, you know, I talked about um, Lincolnshire where clearly they've done a similar sort of project to the one that Simon described. I think ultimately it is, isn't it, about that engagement um, and understanding. And I think, I guess I would say, having led um, a local authority that may have, you know, done some projects like this, it is ultimately about the communication that you need to relate to people the priorities around doing this and that it isn't as you say, necessarily a cost saving or for other reasons. But I think ultimately it's also about a balance. I think about my own ward, very lucky to represent a beautiful part of stoke on -Trent with a huge amount of green space around it where residents are really keen to see it kept neat and tidy. However, equally, we've been able to balance that with some quite large areas um, that are left to be wild. Um, there's lots and lots of trees there. At times I feel like I'm, I'm the councillor for Sherwood Forest. Um, but actually, I think you can achieve that balance where residents really do enjoy um, the areas where it's both nicely maintained, but equally the contrast to the wildness of the trees, the longer grass and the habitats as a result of that. And I think, you know, the, the species that you see come through and the wildlife that's certainly out there the other day. For those who are not familiar with Stoke-on-Trent, you ought to be, it's only down the road. Um, I went to the library the other day in Mia, which is a ward um, that I live in. It's one of the most deprived in the country. And as I was in the library, we actually saw three foxes out the window. So that's in the middle of a very urban area of Stoke-on-Trent um, as a result, I think, of some of the work that's gone on around how you can have that balance between the bloody mess, as you described, <laughs> but also a fantastic wildlife habitat. Thank, Thank you, Abby. And I guess one other way to bring citizens with us is citizen science projects. And I wondered, Rebecca, if you had anything that you could report on that DEF was doing on that front. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that. And th uh, that's a very important point. And in fact, in our work that we're doing on water, uh, we've had a fantastic engagement with citizen science, with people feeding information, because of course, uh, uh, we who live, you know, out and about, live on a stream or a tributary or whatever, uh, are, are, the, are the main people to see the daily changes. So um, we've already got a lot of citizens' data being fed in, and we're trying to, through our plan for water, open up um, those opportunities to better use that data uh, to drive us in the directions that we are moving for our water, particularly, uh, as I mentioned, the catchment scale. We want an action plan for every single tributary in the country uh, and all the little streams that lead in. Uh, and actually to engage citizens is really useful on that. I had a great visit um, just last week. I was in Chesham and Amersham and they got a, an amazing uh, work going on on their chalk river there. And, and I met lots and lots of the people uh, in fact, I went out with my net into the river to, to catch the um, fact they were finding bullheads and creatures I used to find as a child, which some of which sadly have disappeared, but they're all coming back because of the restoration. And we're trying to work out how we can have a big data system. It's complicated with IT that we can make better use of all of this data that people will actually be able to see as well. And then that feeds into our policies. And, and I suppose the po some great points being made here about engaging local um, people to do their work but that so I see government comes in at sort of top level setting targets to drive nature and restoration that's why I think our target to um, uh, halt and uh, stop the decline of nature by 2030 is really important but then you've got to work right back down to the ground level uh, for our policies which will help move that on and then to engage uh, all of us to do our bit um, and uh, just to say there's some useful information on various DEFRA websites. We do have a, a pollinator strategy. We do have some great uh, tips and hints about bee-friendly gardens. Uh, I've done quite a bit of writing in garden publications and magazines. And there are just so many simple things we can all do, actually, to make a difference. And just when I was on our parish council, one of the things we did on our own village, we actually created a village garden. Uh, and that got everyone engaged. But now, of course, it's teeming with bees, birds and butterflies. Um, and I know lots of you are doing things like that, but you know these are the are the simple steps that will actually help hit our targets to to do the restoration we genuinely do need. Thank you, Rebecca. So head on to Defra's website for some pre bedtime reading tonight. Then I guess. Um, 
final question from me before I head over to the audience, and that is the topic of rewilding, which I appreciate has become a controversial term in recent years, but it's something that Ben and Chris drew on in their introductory remarks. So I'd be interested to hear, recognising, as Chris said, that there is a role for rewilding, um, and it doesn't have to come at the expense of food production across the country. How do we counter that misinformation, representing the value that rewilding can have on the landscape? Um, I'll turn to you, Chris, first, if you have any extra comments, and then Ben. Well, I, th I think we, we, the best way of selling rewilding is to do it. And people can see it and see the benefits. I mean, anybody who wanders around NEP, I mean, the reality is NEP still produces food, not in the way it used to be. It, it used to be a, uh, a, 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 a big dairy farm that struggled to make money, uh, which over thousands of acres seems very strange, but it was, um, it was struggling to make money given the nature of the investment that was required. It has been transformed into a haven for nature, but it also produces food. Um, if you go to Slimbridge, where they took down the sea wall, they let the, the sea flood in. There were salt marsh cattle grazing alongside migrating birds. Mm. So you don't have to give up food production altogether to rewild. You'd certainly change the nature of that production, and it's probably smaller and higher quality. And we absolutely shouldn't rewild our whole countryside. But you know, it, it, these projects do make a, a, a really crucial difference. Uh, and I think you know we are able you know we grow most of our food on about 60 percent of our land it really ought to be possible to provide a decent balance between making land available for nature sometimes in small scales which is what the farming reforms are all about sometimes in larger scales like heel rewilding in in somerset which is hundreds of acres um, but it's the right thing to do thank you chris ben i mean that's so perfectly put you, they, Roy Stewart said in his podcast, problem with, with uh, uh, Ben Goldsmith and some of these other rewilders is they want half the country to be Alaska and the other half to be Kansas. And it, it's complete nonsense. You know, rewilding has been shown in study after study to be a really good pathway for social and economic renewal in landscapes that really don't produce very much food. And food production doesn't need to stop in those places. Now, as Chris said, Cattle are a native keystone species. You know, long before there were people in Britain, there were wild cattle. They reckon the last ones, the aurochs, were taken by the Romans to fight in the Colosseum. And these, these, these wild cattle and then their domestic successors, the native Old English longhorns, or Scottish highland cattle and so on, play a vital role in restoring nature. They graze, they browse, they trample, they create incredibly important disturbance. And that's how we end up with these wonderful mosaic, um, uh, richly vibrant, wood pasture systems that you might call rewilding. You know, wilder farming would be just as good, or silvo pasture or wood pasture. So, so rewilding in the way it's understood in Britain is a really good way to keep farmers in the landscape whilst delivering environmental things that we all need, whilst continuing to produce a little bit of food and having an extraordinary recovery of nature. That There is no conflict, it's kind of a silver bullet. Um, and that, that's the message we need to get across, is that this is a really exciting, um, it's a really exciting new economic pathway for the least productive 20 or 30% of our island, which produces less than 1 or 2% of the food as it, as it currently is. Um, I, I also think there's a, there's a psychological point about control. You know, th there's no doubt that there's been a sea change in public attitudes towards untidiness, you know, rough nature, self-willed nature. That's all changing. People are generally happy now to see less mowing on the verges and so on. But among those that manage the land, there is still a very powerful um, impulse to control and to tidy. And, and that's where we need a psychological shift. You know, uh, and I think beavers, talking about rewilding, come to encapsulate the moment. You get those in then. Of course. <laughs> so t t ten, it took that long. <laughs> ten, years ago, ten years ago, no one knew that beavers were once native to Britain. No one knew. Now you struggle to find someone who doesn't know not only that they're native, but that they're back and that they're playing a vital role in, 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 in breathing life back into our landscapes while mitigating flooding and drought. That's a huge change because when a species like beavers move back into the landscape, it does involve a loss of control. You know, we have to step back 10 or 15 meters from every little water course, the ones that Rebecca and the DEFRA team want to restore. We have to step back and give the beavers some degree of autonomy to do what they do, which is to create the mess, which is to garden and create little dams and these ribbon wetlands and so on. 
And so I think that is part of the psychological shift is the idea that we don't need to control every every square inch. And if you cross the channel and go to France on holiday or Italy or Spain, you'll find loads of places that are just thrumming with life and the the chirruping of frogs at night and, and, and rough grasses and things that are never managed by people. And they're quite comfortable with giving control to other species. So I think it's, it's a psychological shift that needs to take place among those that manage the land. And I think financial incentives will, 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 will go some way towards doing that. Thank you, Ben. And Rebecca, do you have any comments on DEFRA's approach to rewilding and perhaps also species introduction, seen as Ben's gone for beavers? Uh, yeah, I actually, I don't personally like the term rewilding. I call it renaturing um, because it does seem to get people, some people's backs up. So I think bring them all on board. I call it renaturing. Um, but also, I, I, do, I do think back to a point that was made earlier, we have to recognise the remarkable transition we've made in thinking actually since leaving the EU with our Environment Act and indeed our um, even Fisheries Act and Ag Act, which has moved us to this much more sustainable approach. Uh, and um, so that we are now paying uh, farmers and landowners, those who manage the land, which uh, is 70% uh, of, of our land, to deliver public goods, of which uh, working with nature and realising that we can have food production and more nature uh, you know, is possible. And I think uh, we, we are doing it in the pockets with the individual farmers but we're also we are we have a lot of schemes now these big large-scale landscape recovery schemes and the, the next tranche is now open to draw people together to work jointly which is which is what is so important actually to link up all of these areas i visited a lot of fascinating projects over the summer during my water walkabout uh, one of which was spain's hall i don't know if anybody's been there um and a lot of work um, focusing on putting back ponds but also um, there is funding now available for example to do buffer zones along rivers you know these are get, going to you, you you know they are basically being rewilded renatured but they bring so many multiple benefits um, in terms of holding back water stopping the soil running off at the same time being filled with nature so there are so many multiple spin-offs here um, and even on farming today this morning, I don't know if anybody heard it, they were talking about growing cock's foot, which again, I remember well from my childhood, uh, and whether that's a better than obviously rye grass, you know, growing more varieties. There's a chap sitting back there from the Nature Friendly Farming Network, isn't it? You know, growing heritage crops that potentially are more climate resilient, um, but actually bring us lots of benefits and they're better for nature because we're gonna have more of a mixture of uh, species back in what we grow so i think call it re renaturing uh, but i do think we're going in the direction of having the right the right projects in place uh to deliver what we need to deliver the critical thing is we do need to get all the farmers to sign up to these things because uh, they are obviously the ngos actually in fairness have, have, are helping a great deal and have access to apply to lots of these funds we do need to get the agricultural industry uh, to come on board. We've had an amazing up uptake in our countryside stewardship schemes and lots of things I've talked about come under those. We've got 32,000 schemes running now uh, and it's really escalated recently and we've got our new sustainable farming initiative open uh, for lots of these schemes as well that we must get that community engaged if we're really going to deliver what we need. Thank you, Rebecca. Now over to you. Any audience questions? Oh, the front row shot up. So <laughs> come to the lady on the second row first, as I knew, put your hand up midway through, and then we'll do. We'll take batches of three. We're obviously all aware of the sewage discharge into the rivers, and I'm not sure what could be what you think should be done about that. But also, how has business been a solution or working with you? to be part of the solution uh, because we're always aware of the ones that are part of the problem. Sure, could you pass the mic to the lady with the lovely blue dress? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm from the Horticultural Trade Association, Jennifer Feezy, and I would say we're one of the sectors who are the businesses who deliver for green spaces. So much has been talked about the agriculture industry. We're all on the environmental horticulture side of things, so we grow the plants and trees that are needed to deliver much of the, the green spaces that we have. So I'm really interested to hear if there's any reflections, particularly from the Minister, about how you work outside of DEFRA, perhaps with planning, with education, uh, with procurement to really deliver for uh, the economy as well as for the environment and health and well-being of society as well, because we think we can tick all the boxes. Fantastic. And the gentleman to go 
Uh, hi, Robert McElveen from the Mineral Products Association. So um, in this quarry is particularly relevant here. We've got decades of experience of doing fantastic restorations with private money rather than public money, so it doesn't always need to be funded by taxpayers. Um, but really a question, picking up on the comments around linking up sites, we have fan absolutely fantastic point sites, effectively, that can be restored really well. But then it's the challenge is to get them linked up into those wider areas. Relatedly, biodiversity net gain really doesn't work very well in the metric for our industry because it's very different timelines to housing, which is what it's been designed for, and whether there's any scope to use that as a tool to actually fund some of those linking up um, projects. Thank you. Just to flag that we do have a CEN event at 3.30 about the topic of water pollution specifically, so oh. you may want to linger for that one, um, and I'm not sure if the Minister wants to touch on it now, um, <laughs> that you can. <laughs> um, but first we'll go to the question on business partnerships. Um, Simon, I don't know if you want to go in first as a partner yourself. Yes, thank you very much. That, that, that's a really good question. Um, I didn't mention much about business partnerships in my uh, opening remarks, but um, actually we, we do work quite closely with business on a number of environmental projects. Um, I would say at the moment not so much in this arena of re rewilding and um, providing more access, um, but uh, you know, th there's certainly very strong business links. One example is the the work we're doing on sustainable palm oil, and we've made Chester the first sustainable palm oil city and working with 50 businesses across the city um, to procure uh, from sustainable sources. So that's an example. Um, but I do think that there's a, there's a huge role for business here. And I think there's a big appetite for business as well. When you, you hear, you, you talk to, to people, certainly businesses in our city, you know, they want to help. They want to find ways of helping. Um, and I think as we develop our lottery project, we'll certainly be looking at that. Um, and, you know, it would be great to, to, to hear from the others about the sort of incentives that, that government can provide. Thank you. Abby, I wondered if you had worked with any business partners through any of your projects, if you have any. Yeah, so um, I was going to mention a, a project that maybe some people might in the room might be familiar with, a, a project called Sunrise in stoke on and North Staffordshire, which actually featured on BBC um, Countryside programme as well a, a few years ago. Um, we are a, a growing city, um, and I was very keen when I was leader of the council to see um, an increase in house building within the city. We've got a number of derelict sites, but we also have um, the River Trent that runs through the city, and particularly in the middle of the town of Stoke. Um, it's a geography thing that's going on. Um, the centre of Stoke, where the River Trent runs through, it actually goes underground into various culverts and all sorts of things like that. And it meant that one of these particular sites, which was a, a landmark site that I was very keen to see developed, the developer was going to struggle with that and you get then into that space don't you around kind of where does development meet the nature agenda and people often have quite a negative view of developers themselves but we worked or we brought together a consortium used a bit of government money used money through the lap um, to work with the developers at Modwins along with Staffordshire Wildlife Trust to actually reroute the River Trent. Now it had been running through a concrete culvert which clearly is never going to be the right thing really is it. Um, so what they were able to do is reroute the river, um, rewild a lot of what was going on there. It meant the housing could come forward. It's actually a really nice estate that's there. It runs next to the A500 dual carriageway through the city, which is quite a noisy site, but having been on site numerous times during the development of all this, actually what it's done is reduce the impact of the A500 through the city. Um, you know, we have a challenge around air quality within the city that I know the Minister and I have talked about before, so it's reduced that. It's um, improved the quality of the River Trent. It's allowed us to bring um, biodiversity back into the centre. It's created a, a really good housing um, estate that, that sold really well, created more housing in the city that is keen to do that and bring it forward, and actually allowed the developers to play a very strong part within that. So you know, everybody is winning there around that fantastic environment now then. It's really interesting to go down and have a look what's happened there. But I think it's, it's stories like that, isn't it, that we perhaps need to hear a bit more of and they start to combat this idea that it's one side versus the other one. Actually, I think we're all on, on the same side with this. Thank you, Abby. And I guess from business partnerships to business opportunity from nature, perhaps, Chris, do you have anything? Well, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to see in the next few years some pretty radical changes. The, uh, this is on a global uh, level. Uh, in the wake of the various COPs uh, that have taken place in the recent years, um, there is a big international push towards uh, 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 effectively reporting systems for business about their impact on nature. Uh, and you know, the blueprints are now on the table. There's a task force set up to prepare a plan. It has done that. Uh, it will now be for individual countries to legislate in this direction. But it's very hard to see uh, that in five years' time, 
there won't be a very serious duty upon business to uh, 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 report on its impact on nature and on the environment. Uh, that will mean the business has no option but to work more closely with organisations that can mitigate its impact on nature or help it reduce its impact on nature. So I think there are huge opportunities now mm -hmm. to bring private funding into the whole area of nature restoration. Uh, and I think every group that's involved in doing so should be looking for those opportunities over the next year or two. Thank you, Chris. Rebecca? Uh, well, really, re reiterate what Chris says, and actually, um, wherever you go and whoever you meet, you know, we can't, we can't expect uh, all of our nature restoration and recovery, all the things we, we require to be just delivered by government, for example, but business partnerships, we've heard some good examples already about Chester Duke. Business, uh, the partnership work is just critical for the, for the future, and for leveraging in extra funds, uh, and uh, many businesses are already... Uh, uh, involved in many of these partnerships and even the water companies who get a bit of a bad press many of them are already working in partnership with other companies organizations NGOs farmers to deliver systems of cleaning up water uh, restoring restoration projects uh, and, and so forth reducing um, in, inputs you know whether it's phosphates nitrates going into the water and there's obviously a huge market some of which has already started and some of which is sort of latent waiting to really get kick-started but we've got the carbon credit market the woodland credit market the biodiversity net gain market uh, we've got um the potential phos phosphate offset or, you know offsetting market so there's there's money there um and it's it's it's, it's a new world but it is definitely coming um and it's a very important important part of of what uh, what we are doing as a government we've produced a green finance strategy for example uh, and uh, and a nature markets framework so it's it's all it's all um, underway I would say but it will really escalate uh, in the future thank you and then on the third question around linking up and how to potentially fund those links I mean access to nature can mean as one park but as Chris mentioned oases are only as good as the corridors that surround them and therefore whether it's a, a child walking to school or I mean, anybody commuting it's better to have a greener more pleasant place to live and so I wondered then perhaps based on your uh, project with the Mayor of London if you had any thoughts on well, that. Claire, Claire Coutinho the new energy and net zero secretary has championed an idea called the wild belt um, which would be a new planning designation which can be overlaid on existing designations such as area of outstanding natural beauty or, or green belt, but which would designate an area which is being improved for nature, possibly using public money, possibly not. Um, and it's, it's, it's a policy that has some kind of traction within uh, parts of the Conservative Party, and I think it's a really good idea. Because at the moment, somewhere that has no nature, but which will, on account of receiving public money, doesn't have any designation to protect it into the future or to provide access to it. And Lawton famously said, we need, we need our nature to be bigger, better, and more joined up. So I think a wild belt would go a long way towards, um, uh, towards achieving all three of those things. I think it's a very powerful idea. Um, I, I, I think, though, in, in terms of um, one of the things Rebecca said, that the landscape recovery end of the environmental land management scheme is the most exciting. Because it's, it's, whilst it's the smallest... It's, um, it's the one that brings clusters of farmers together to restore nature in a dramatic way across a whole area. It has to be a certain size. You know, I live on the edge of one um, in Selwood. Chris was there, Heel, Heel Somerset, pulling together 30 farmers, 12,000 acres to restore wood pasture and wetland across a big chunk of South Somerset. These are game-changing projects which have baked into them the idea of corridors that extend outwards. They really are ink blots. And the criticism was, well, no, none of these farmers are going to want this landscape recovery stuff. You know, they want to prioritise food production no matter where they are. Well, in fact, in year one, there was a deluge. Only 22 projects were approved out of, out of many times more than that of applications. And the quality of the applications, as well as the volume of applications, has expanded again this year. So I think a really easy win for the Conservative government is to expand landscape recovery, to put more money into it. Because this is the way we secure the livelihoods of farmers who are very significantly threatened in some of our most precious and most nature depleted and least productive agricultural landscapes. 
So I, I, I would say a wild belt and an expanded landscape recovery thing will go a long way towards tackling a lot of the things we've been discussing. Thank you, Ben. Uh, now to some more questions. Um, Sam, perhaps the woman in front of you. <laughs> Uh, Hilary McGrady, uh, National Trust. Um, just an observation first and then a question. Um, I, I absolutely, being one of those NGOs that probably has put some pressure um, on the government in the past, I think we absolutely would recognise the progress that has been made. I, I genuinely do. I think what we're worried about is that the crisis is of such um, at such a stage that we, we all believe that we need to go faster. And I think I'm very encouraged to hear that that's what you've said today. So what we're concerned about is that the sense of momentum could be faltering so that that's all i would leave it it's not it's not a sense that there hasn't been progress because there definitely has i have a question um and i i definitely would support the uh, the previous question around how to um connect the networks as it were because the trust 10 minutes away from here um has a project at castlefield viaduct which was all about bringing green space into an urban context to act as the start of a green corridor but what i've been really struck by is that i know of loads of different organizations cheshire being only one of them doing brilliant work but i'm finding it really hard to connect with them so so what can be done to help connect all of the various folk that are doing i think really brilliant work but how can we make uh, greater some of the parts really Thank you. And the gentleman, yeah, Barry. Hi there, I'm Henry Wilmot, and I'm in sort of natural capital, regenerative agriculture. And I think what I'm seeing with farmers is that they want to be rewarded for the environmental goods they produce. And with recent changes on nutrient neutrality, but also with the Financial Times um, reporting today about carbon prices collapsing um, for the UK emissions trading scheme, how best can um, the government also keep incentivizing and reassuring investors this is the best country to invest in nature recovery? So specifically on sort of voluntary natural capital markets, how can we reassure private capital to keep investing? Thank you. And the gentleman just in front. Thanks, Kitty. Um, Jim from Zurich Insurance. So we insure councils like uh, uh, Councillor Abbey uh, Browns. Um, what can we do to green urban environments? Um, I think it was spoken on the panel earlier about if you're not rich and rural, you often don't have very good access to nature. So what can be done to create these some of these small uh, green uh, infrastructure projects in urban areas and uh, you know, they'll have biodiversity benefits and they'll have lots of other benefits, urban cooling and others. I know Rebecca's uh, department made an announcement at the beginning of this year about SUDS. <laughs> um, so, you know, things like that. What can be done in an urban setting? Thank you. Conscious of time, so I ask panellists to keep your responses brief. Um, Chris, did you want to respond yeah, to Hillary? i pick up on Hillary's point. Look, I, th I think the issue is, being absolutely frank, some of the campaigns have been completely misleading and over the top, and they discredit the NGOs and they damage their relationship with the government. I'll give you a very practical example, and I, I'm not defending the short period of time when Liz Truss was Prime Minister, but the investment zones policy was all about kind of recreating the London Docklands experience. The campaign of which the organisation was passed, part produced maps showing the areas affected. It showed the whole of Norfolk as being likely to be affected by the government's strategy to remove nature protections. That was absolute nonsense. Um, and it discredited the campaign and it really annoyed people like me who are on your side uh, because I'm then trying to kind of say, well, how can we work with these organisations when they're actually telling things about the government which are simply not true? And that's the point. You need to make sure that when you campaign, and I'm all in favour of the pressure, it's done in a measured, smart way that reflects the good things that are done and said this is not enough. And that's been the problem. And some of the stuff, it's not, there have been other campaigns, I see them as MP, I look at that thing, this is absolute nonsense. I've got some in my inbox over this weekend. I look at the, this is absolute nonsense. They're being written by NGOs, um, sent to my constituents, and they're just not true. And that's the problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 
Conscious of time, but <laughs> you two can pick this up afterwards, perhaps. Um, <laughs> um, I'll go to Abby now on the question of greening urban environments specifically, and then also perhaps to Simon uh, in the Chester context. Thank you. Um, I'm probably going to do two here, in a way, if that's okay, Kitty, which is around access to nature in urban settings, but also um, the, qu uh, the question that Hillary raised in terms of how do we join all these things together. Um, I'm a big believer that... Um, government, whether it's central or local, actually have a, has a huge responsibility around convening. Local, nobody would design a business like a local authority who delivers 700 services that are doing everything from looking after the most vulnerable in society to bringing better jobs to your places. I would love to say that it, council should be absolutely out there saying, let's bring it all together, let's create a map and what have you. But the reality is we're trying to do lots of things. However, what we do have the power to do is bring together organisations to start to work out how they can have agency themselves to do that. Some of the things that I've been involved with um, in Stoke Contrant are around bringing together um, national agencies, Arts Council England, Historic England, but you can also bring in others, Wildlife Trust, other organisations, to then create that conversation yourself. So that takes some of the burden off the local authority, but actually enables that agency to start to bring things together. So you can then the access in terms of the mapping but equally then in terms of the access to urban settings so a particular project I would mention in Stoke-on-Trent is the Portland Inn project just recently received some cash I think through the community ownership fund which is brilliant it's in a very deprived neighborhood within the city where um, we brought forward a project around one pound houses but actually there is some green space there is often lots of green space within urban areas people will say to me there isn't in Stoke-on-Trent but there's that much it's one of the greenest cities in the UK but people don't almost always think of those smaller patches of land that are not a formalized park perhaps or something else but projects like the Portland Inn project advance absolutely brilliant facilities they've used a cocktail of funding from the local authority from Arts Council England and variety of others to create a fantastic setting there they're really interested in urban nature they're creating opportunities for young people in the area and doing great stuff so I'm very much for local authorities being conveners and working with organisations to bring projects like that forward and then to map and share that and raise the awareness for people. Thank you. Could I ask very Chris, <laughs> very um, brief comments on this one? I'll pass it to Rebecca. Um, I agree very much with what Abby said there um, about you know bringing people together and I would just like to say that um, uh, you, you mentioned Arts Council funding and that sort of thing and that that's um, a very sort of strong tradition in our society. And it's nice to see some of the, that funding now extending to, to heritage, to natural heritage as well as, uh, you know, historical heritage. And I would like to see that go further because we, we know how important nature is to people's well-being, um, as, as, as are the arts. I'm, I would say they're equal and, and therefore we should be putting the funding into that. And then just very briefly on the, the NGOs issue. Um, we're passionate people in the NGOs. We believe strongly in what we're doing. And, you, you know, we, we want to, to, to save our wildlife and save our nature. And that, that's why these debates sometimes get a bit heated. But ju just to, to sort of highlight something that we've all done together. So the Wildlife and Countryside Link, of which we're members, uh, has brought together uh, the 75 organisations, the members, and produced this Nature 2030 strategy, which is actually um, a plea for all the political parties to put nature front and centre uh, of their manifesto commitments and there's some great ideas in here some some of them link with some of the, the conversations we've been having so I would urge you to have a look at that when you're developing the Conservative Party manifesto thank you and I'll give the final word to you Rebecca very briefly on the question of private markets for nature oh, actually on that point Thanks. while we're being a bit political sure. um, you know, I really, I, I do get quite exasperated about this message that seems to have been spread that we're not doing enough for the environment. Yes, there's always more to do, but we have put so much in motion now. I wish everyone would go away and shout about it. We are the champions of the environment. It's actually one of the reasons I went to Parliament. And we are now doing and working on those policies that I went there to try and get in place. And yes, it is challenging, but look how much progress we've made. I think we need to shout about it a lot more. We do, of course, need to do a great deal more. But I never hear the Labour Party talking about nature. I don't think they've got a nature strategy. And certainly the Liberal Democrats, they don't have any plan for any of this. But we've got the legislation now. You know, we've got um, some game-changing, you know, new ways of running and managing our land and our landscape. And um, I actually think we need to go out there and shout about it a bit more. We've got great people like Ben on our case all the time to 
because we're never doing enough for Ben, are we? But you know, but I would be in the same camp. So, and and I and that is what I think we should do. Just on Sud, somebody mentioned it. One of my pet subjects. Uh, you don't need to tell Defra about how important sustainable urban drainage is. Go and have a chat to the Duluc department. We've done a two-year review of it, and we know it's absolutely critical. And it's so important in urban areas for bringing in nature, as well as controlling flooding and being able to finally to separate our sewage pipes, to that lady's point, and our other water pipes. Um, and we need to get them in. Uh, okay, so that uh, go and lobby a few other departments as well. <laughs> I, I, I think the, 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 the point on messaging is the, the point on messaging is so important. We we saw when the solar market was emerging that a little bit of chopping and changing could have catastrophic impacts for young companies doing something very very new. I mean, remember, two thousand five, solar was about uh, eccentrics like my elderly uncle buying something incredibly expensive to put on their roof, and it didn't work. Well, now solar is a mainstream asset class and is hugely reliable and 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 and, and very predictable and we need the same thing to happen to natural capital so I think that the, the problem with a little bit of chopping and changing in terms of messaging coming out of number 10 is firstly that it, it serves to unpick investor confidence and slow down the progress of those markets and secondly it serves to unpick a very hard fought reputation for uh, being the party for nature and, and we've done some really amazing things and I do think that reputation has been harmed in the last year or two by just ill thought through messaging. Now, I think we should be shouting from the rooftops about the amazing things that have happened, and we need to create an environment of predictability and calm and, and so on around this stuff. Um, and with that. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. I'm sorry for overrunning everybody if you've got other panels to attend, but if not, then stay tuned because in half an hour, the next SEN, SEN panel is Can We Rely on Private Finance to Build a Resilient Net Zero Future? Thank you so much again to Chester Tizou for sponsoring today's event, and thank you to Rebecca, Chris, Ben, Abby, and Simon. Thank you.